time for the Longines Chronoscope, a television journal of the important issues of the hour, brought to you every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. A presentation of the Longines Whitnor Watch Company, maker of Longines, the world's most honored watch, and Whitnor, distinguished companion to the world-honored Longines. Good evening, this is Frank Knight. May I introduce our co-editors for this edition of the Longines Chronoscope? Mr. William Bradford Huey, editor of the American Mercury, and Mr. Henry Hazlitt, contributing editor of Newsweek magazine. Our distinguished guest for this evening is the Honorable Joseph R. McCarthy, United States Senator from Wisconsin. The opinions expressed are necessarily those of the speakers. Senator McCarthy, our viewers, of course, know that you are one of the most controversial political figures of our time. And this is your first appearance since your rather overwhelming victory in the Wisconsin primaries. Now, sir, uh, what uh, brings you east at this time? Your program largely, Mr. Huey. And uh, I believe that uh, also this week you expect to uh, make an address in Connecticut. Is that correct, I'm sir? I'm speaking tomorrow night at the Klein Memorial Hall at Bridgeport, Connecticut. And, uh, of course, our viewers know that uh, in Connecticut, uh, that's the home state of uh, a man that you've had a few words with, Senator Bill Benton. Now, sir, uh, uh, what... what What's the purpose of your going into into Connecticut? Is it to defeat Senator Brennan, Benton or to try to help defeat Senator Benton? My purpose, uh, Mr. Huey, will be about the same as the purpose in some 12, 13 states that I'll visit, and that is to bring important facts to the American people. You see, I, I got a very strong feeling that uh, the most of our people in public life underestimate the intelligence of the American people. Uh, they try to argue and tell people how to vote. I think you need merely give the people the facts, and then you can go home and don't worry. They'll vote right. Well, now, at Bridgeport, Connecticut, uh, do I understand you correct to say, when you, to say that you are opening a, a, a 12 or 13-state uh, drive now in support of the national ticket? I think I'll be in... I may be wrong on the number, Mr. Huey. I think that I am now scheduled to speak in some 13 or 14 states where they have close senatorial contests. Well, Senator, a lot of people came into your state, into Wisconsin, to try to defeat you in the primaries, and it seemed to have worked the other way. Mm -hmm. Now, don't you think that perhaps when you go into these states, it may have that sort of effect? Well, Mr. Hazlitt, uh, uh, that's Brown Hazlitt, right? That's right. I'm sorry. <laughs> Mr. Hazlitt, I do not intend to go into those states and tell the people how to vote. I don't intend to go in and, and discuss the local men running for Congress or for Senator. I intend to go into those states and give the American people uh, the cold, documented picture of the sellout in Korea, the extent to which communism has been directing our foreign policy, uh, our suicidal foreign policy, if you please. And if the American people want more of that, then they can vote for the present administration. I may say this. Uh, that my appeal is, uh, is largely made to Democrats. Uh, I feel that the millions of Americans who have long voted the Democrat ticket are just as loyal, they love America just as much, they hate communism just as much as the average Republican. And I think it is up to those uh, loyal Democrats to realize that as of today, they don't have a party in Washington. The only way they can uh, have a change is by voting Republican. Well, do you think a lot of Democrats came in and voted for you in the Wisconsin election? I don't think it. I, I know it. Uh, our normal, let's put it this way, two years ago, the Democratic vote was about 47% of the total. Republicans vote 53%. This year, we had a, uh, let's see, I think these figures are right, 83% Republican vote, 17% Democrat vote, and most of the Democrats uh, apparently voted for McCarthy because I carried the Democrat ward uh, normally better than I carry the Republican wards, which, which uh, proves my contention, and that is that in this fight against communism, it isn't a Democrat fight, it isn't a Republican fight. And for that reason, I don't go into any state and tell the people how to vote. What is the broader interpretation of your own victory in Wisconsin as you see it? Well, I would say, Mr. Hazlitt, number one, uh, it was not a vote for McCarthy. Uh, it was a vote on an issue an all-important issue. The American people recognize that the one real issue 
uh, not the phony issue, is the issue of communism, uh, corruption, all tied up with the Korean War and uh, World War, call it two and a half, call it a police action, call it what you may. It means that the American people are sick way down deep inside at what's been going on. And that, it, it was, I'd like to consider it a tribute to McCarthy, but it was not, it was a vote upon an all-important issue. And I just hope that uh, many of our good friends realize that that is the well, issue this well year. Well, you imply, Senator, by saying that they didn't vote for McCarthy, you imply that you've become something of a symbol now to a large group of Americans. Now, just what do you believe you symbolize in the American political scene now? I don't, I don't uh, quite like the way you put that question, Mr. Huey. Uh, let's put it this way. Uh, uh, many people have been waiting for someone to expose the extent to which our suicidal foreign policy has been dictated from the Kremlin. Uh, they've been waiting for someone to really get up and fight corruption the way men like Senator Williams have fought it. And uh, I think my people in Wisconsin were voting an approval of a fight against communism, corruption, the sellout of American interests. And uh, uh, they, weren't voting, they weren't voting for Joe McCarthy. Well, would you I, I, hap I happen to be the recipient of the vote yeah. and I certainly uh, appreciate it a great deal. Well, would you say the other side of that coin is that you were the recipient of all the protest vote in Wisconsin? I mean, that, that they were voting for you in order to protest against uh, what, what you outline uh, have been the failures of the administration. That, that might well be, uh, Mr. Hewitt. Senator, I wanted to ask you about this word, McCarthyism. Mm -hmm. Am I right in supposing that the first one who used that word was Owen Lattimore in testimony before the Tidings Committee? Owen Lattimore first used it. Uh, let, me, let me correct myself. I think it was first used by Lattimore or by the Daily Worker, but the testimony now is that 40 top communists met in New York and decided how they would fight McCarthy and that they then coined the phrase McCarthyism. Now, as to the date of that, whether that was the day before Lattimore testi testified or the day after, I frankly don't know. But that's the origin, as you see it. Either the Daily Worker's publication of it or the Owen Lattimore testimony was the yes. first time it was used. Or, or the, uh, the testimony by uh, uh, Howard Rushmore, the yeah. 40 communists met and said, we'll, we'll coin the phrase McCarthyism and use that. I wanted to ask you here something about a uh, point that came up in the testimony uh, the congressional testimony about the Institute of Pacific Relations. Uh, this was about a year ago, and it was a letter uh, written by the uh, secretary of the IPR uh, to a Mr. Barnett asking about a meeting they were going to have at Mount Tremblant and the people that they ought to invite to that meeting. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, William Lockwood uh, says here in, in writing as secretary of the IPR, Another possibility we might consider is someone from Knox's office or Stimson's. Coe and Hiss, meaning Alger Hiss, mentioned Adlai Stevens, one of Knox's special assistants. Well, that must mean Adlai Stevenson because uh, there, uh, he was one of Knox's special mm -hmm. assistants then and there was no Stevens. Now, why, in your opinion, would uh, Hiss, back in 1942, have recommended Adlai Stevenson as a participant in that meeting uh, what qualifications did Adlai Stevenson have as, a, let's say, a Far Eastern expert at that time? All the qualifications that Alger Hiss wanted in a man, I would say. And uh, keep in mind that Cole, the other man recommended by Alger Hiss, has been named under oath seven times as either a communist or an espionage agent. Uh, uh, I mean, let, 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 let me say this. I'd rather not go to Stevenson's record in too great detail at this time because we have just completed a complete and thorough research on Adlai Stevenson. Who is I'm, we? Uh, 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 well, <laughs> uh, and, uh, and I intend to uh, give that picture yes. on a nationwide network and television, I hope, also. And after I give that picture of Stevenson, it isn't a picture that I've created. It's his own history. It's Adlai Stevenson's history of Adlai Stevenson since the time he entered the Agricultural Department in 1933 when Alger Hiss and Perlman and the rest entered. And after I give that history of Stevenson, uh, if the American people want him, they can have him. I don't think they'll want him. Well, uh, Senator, I gather from what you say that it's fair to infer that you will not avoid personalities 
uh, in your 13 states that you expect to speak in now? I will never avoid giving the facts to the American people, Mr. Huey. It's so easy, you see, to talk about communism generally, to talk about the sellout in China and Korea generally. But unless you call the role of the traitors, unless you call the role of those who have been responsible for the suicidal foreign policy, it's a waste of the speaker's time and the audience time. And I don't intend to ever get up and, in general terms, talk about treason, talk about sellouts. I, you see, foreign policy isn't like little Topsy, it doesn't just grow. Treason isn't like little Topsy, it doesn't just grow. It's created by men with faces and men with names. And I think those of us who have been elected by the American people to man the watchtowers, unless we have the intelligence to recognize the traitors, and then, if I may use a word which we use in Wisconsin, unless we have the guts to name them, we should be taken down from those watchtowers and should not be representing the American people. And I don't intend to ever avoid giving the names of traitors, giving the names of communists, when I discover them in important position. Well, Senator, we appreciate it very much for your being with us tonight. Well, thank, thank you, Mr. Hesley. The editorial board for this edition of the Longines Chronoscope was Mr. William Bradford Huey and Mr. Henry Hazlitt. Our distinguished guest was the Honorable Joseph R. McCarthy, United States Senator from Wisconsin. It's World Series time again, the best days of the year for baseball fans. And this year again, the World Series is Longines time. Yes, all umpires of both American and National Baseball Leagues use Longines watches exclusively for timing all the games, including the World Series. Truly, the most honored watch in the world of sport is Longines, the world's most honored watch. The only watch in history to win 10 World's Fair grand prizes, 28 gold medals, and so many honors for accuracy in fields of precise timing. Now that's why, throughout the world, no other name on a watch carries the prestige of Longines, the world's most honored watch in sport. The watch of first choice with discriminating people the world over. And yet do you know that you may buy and own or buy and proudly give a Longines watch for as little as $71.50. Longines, the world's most honored watch, premier product of the Longines Whitnor Watch Company since 1866, maker of watches of the highest character. We invite you to join us every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday evening at this same time for the Longines Chronoscope, a television journal of the important issues of the hour, broadcast on behalf of Longines, the world's most honored watch, and Whitnor, distinguished companion to the world honored Longines. This is Frank Knight, reminding you that Longines and Whitnor watches are sold and serviced from coast to coast by more than 4,000 leading jewelers who proudly display this emblem, Agency for Longines Whitnor Watches. Starts Friday night, Mr. and Mrs. North on the CBS Television Network. Time for the Longines Chronoscope, a television journal of the important issues of the hour, brought to you every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. A presentation of the Longines Whitnor Watch Company, maker of Longines, the world's most honored watch, and Whitnor, 
distinguished companion to the world-honored Longines. Good evening, this is Frank Knight. May I introduce our co-editors for this edition of the Longines Chronoscope? Mr. William Bradford Huey, editor of the American Mercury, and Mr. Hardy Burt, noted correspondent and author. Our distinguished guest for this evening is Dr. Corliss Lamont, American Labor Party representative. Doc Dr. Lamont, uh, our viewers, of course, many of them uh, know that you are a somewhat controversial political figure, and I'm sure they welcome you tonight and will extend to you the same degree of tolerance that they extended to the views expressed here uh, on our last program by Senator McCarthy. Now, tonight, sir, I believe you are a candidate for the United States Senate in New York. Is that correct? That is true. It's my first campaign for political office. And, uh, and, and you are the candidate for the American Labor Party in New York? That's true. And is that party affiliated with the Progressive Party nationally? Yes, uh, our uh, national ticket uh, for president has Vincent Hallinan and for vice president, Charlotte Bass. And now, the American Labor Party is the New York unit of that party. Now, that's the party that uh, our viewers remember was headed by Mr. Wallace in 1948. Correct. Is that that's yes. correct, sir? Now, sir, uh, you are, uh, have been known uh, through most of your active lifetime, I believe, as an American who was generally friendly toward the Soviet Union. Is that correct, sir? Do you, would you so classify yourself? I think you could say that, yes. May I ask a question here, uh, uh, Doctor, uh, about the great issue in the world, of course, today is whether we can have peace with Russia. We are spending billions of dollars on the premise that uh, we have to stave off Russian attack and so forth. We're sending troops abroad to Europe and all that. Now, do you think it's possible to make peace with Russia without uh, force of arms? I certainly do think it's possible, and of course, if you resort to force of arms, that will result in a terrible Third World War, which nobody can win. I believe that in spite of the Soviet Union's mistakes, which I think are many, and in spite of mistakes on the American side, we can get together over the conference table and wake these things out, making a start with relaxing the tensions that are existing in the world today. Just what would be your method in doing that, getting together with Stalin? That's what you would have to do. Well, yes, I would approve of a, perhaps a five-power conference or a two-power conference on a top level with Churchill, Stalin, and Truman, whoever is president of the United States, and carrying out the idea that uh, the anti-communist Nehru suggested recently of talking these things over in a five-power conference around the conference table. Now, there have been many such conferences as these, and uh, we've usually been disillusioned. Why do you think this time that it'll work out? I don't promise it will work out, but of course I believe we should make immediate steps toward relaxing these tensions by getting an immediate ceasefire in Korea, and then perhaps letting China into the United Nations, and then restoring world trade, which has been disrupted over the past few years. How do we get a ceasefire? Well, I think that the best plan that has been suggested is to let the prisoner of war issue at present go over for settlement between four neutrals, Switzerland, Sweden, Poland, and Czechoslovakia, and let that be settled after the ceasefire and truce has been made on the present basis. I think the North Koreans and the Chinese would agree to such a compromise and that it could be worked out and well, save this endless slaughter which is going on over there in Korea. Well, sir, now, uh, in order to catch your views properly, sir, is it true to say, we, you mentioned that you were one of the Americans who was generally friendly toward Soviet Union. Now, you made several trips to, to Russia, didn't you, during the 30s? I made two trips, Mr. Huey, in 1932 and 1938. Uh, now, and, and during that, that period, uh, you were one of the Americans who thought that there was something enormously hopeful for mankind going on in Russia. That's right, but I was never an apologist for them. I always saw the mistakes and the evils in the Soviet Union. It seems to me that any country has both it, its good and bad sides, and that's certainly true of Russia. Uh, now, for instance, the purge trials in 1937. Uh, you were one of the Americans who thought that those trials were properly and were honorable trials and, and that the government, the Soviet Union, was proper in, in, in carrying out that purge. Well, I think that innocent people suffered in that purge, Mr. Huey, but so far as the great Moscow trials were concerned, I think that they were genuine, and I have a supporter in Winston Churchill 
who in one of his books has said that he believed they were necessary, though regrettable. Now, you have also, uh, is it fair to say that, uh, that you've been generally critical of organized religion, and the Christian religion particularly? Well, um, uh, I've been critical of uh, theology and political ideas in the churches, Mr. Huey, but naturally I support the New Testament ideals and teachings of Jesus and uh, in my own philosophy, bring those in constantly. You, it, it's been your belief that the Christian church in Western Europe, for instance, uh, has been a, a, a reactionary political instrument. Well, I would always want to be specific on that and, and say what church and exactly what was their policy, because many churchmen, many Catholics too, have taken a liberal policy in social affairs and are fighting for international peace today. I'm unwilling to make any overall condemnation of a church, a religion, or a country. Now, you have also been a member or an officer of a number of organizations that have been labeled subversive by the government of the United States. Now, sir, do you have any, any regrets uh, as to those memberships? Well, I can't think that I do, Mr. Huey. As a matter of fact, the whole subversive listing, it seems to me, was <coughs> unconstitutional and illegal. And it was carried out, as you know, without giving any of these organizations a chance to testify and answer the charges against them. Well, sir, now, with that, with that background, what do you regard as a candidate for the United States Senate? What do you regard as the most important issue before the American people today? Well, I think there are two most important issues, if I may put it that way. The restoration of civil liberties for everybody in this country, capitalists, workers, socialists, communists, the enemies of communists, uh, Catholics and atheists and everything else. And the second big issue is international peace and disarmament. Now those two issues I am emphasizing in my campaign and of course they are tied up together. Well now on the first issue, the restoration of, of civil liberties, I take it by that you mean that, that civil, civil liberties are threatened today, that they need restoring. Oh, more than threatened, they have been suppressed right and left here, and indeed it has gone over from the field of a governmental violation to a non-governmental violation in private entertainment fields like uh, radio, even television, movies, and publishing. Would, would you say that uh, Senator McCarthy is a, is a part of that threat? I'm afraid he is, because McCarthy has kept the American people stirred up over uh, an alleged threat of communist insurrection here, and it seems to me has gone much too far in the direction of suppressing, actually, the Bill of Rights and making everybody scared to death, so that people now adopt what they call self-censorship uh, in order to uh, not go out on a limb and uh, not stick their necks out. They just keep quiet. Well, millions you, of Americans. You say making everybody scared to death. Do you believe that a very large number of Americans are living in fear today of Senator McCarthy and what he stands for? Well, not so much of McCarthy himself as the, the, the fear that he has stirred up, the fear of government people losing their jobs because they're accused of some vague relationship to a communist organization back in 1932. All this I consider going pretty far astray. But it's not only McCarthy, the Democrats have a man like that, and his name is McCarran. And he is just as bad, in my opinion, and more powerful, actually, in the Senate of the United States. Well, sir, now, on this problem of peace, which uh, I believe that mo both major parties have found to be the issue that more people are interested in, now, uh, uh, in, in Western Europe, you've expressed in it your opinion on Korea, in Western Europe, are you critical of our maintaining troops in Western Europe? Well, I, I am indeed. I think that it's unnecessary. I don't think that there is really a danger of Soviet military aggression in Western Europe because that isn't the way the Soviets wait. They wait through propaganda and taking advantage of bad economic conditions. Now, as it happens, we are bringing about bad economic conditions in Western Europe. That's one of the great troubles with our policies. Doctor, let me interrupt right here to ask this question because it is pertinent. Uh, suppose we withdrew all uh, financial aid and all of our troops from Europe. Uh, do you think that the communists would pretty much leave Europe alone? Do you think Europe, it's, uh, the European countries themselves would go communist internally? Not necessarily. I believe myself and hope that the European countries of England, France, and Italy might uh, establish reform governments, labor governments, such as you have in England today. But they would have no allegiance to Russia, you think? Not necessarily. There would still be strong communist movements in those countries. But what America has done, it seems to me, through foisting this armaments program on them, 
and disrupting east-west trade is to depress their living standards and in that way open the gates to the communist parties more than before because communists, as you know, thrive on economic misery and on bad economic conditions. Uh, doctor, as a final question, uh, would you tell our audience what kind of America you would like to see during the next four years? Well, I believe America is a great country with a great tradition, but that that tradition has been betrayed since the death of Franklin D. Roosevelt. I believe that with the reestablishment of peace, we can reestablish civil liberties here, and then start a march, renew a march in America toward economic security and abundance for everyone in this country. Is it fair to say that you are a socialist and that you want to see uh, peace restored and then you want to see this government proceed further in the direction of socialism? That's right, toward planned socialism with democratic means putting it into effect and not revolution. You think private property should be owned by the state? Uh, well, not all private property, Mr. Bait, uh, but the main means of production and distribution, yes. Well, sir, I'm, I'm certain that our viewers have enjoyed these forthright views from you, sir, and thank you very much for being with us. The opinions expressed this evening are necessarily those of the speakers. The editorial board for this edition of the Longine Chronoscope was Mr. William Bradford Huey and Mr. Hardy Burt. Our distinguished guest was Dr. Corliss Lamont, American Labor Party representative. It's World Series time again. The best days of the year for baseball fans. And this year again, the World Series is Longine time. Yes, all umpires of both American and National Baseball Leagues Use Longine watches exclusively for timing all the games, including the World Series. Truly, the most honored watch in sports is Longine, the world's most honored watch. The only watch in history to win 10 World's Fair grand prizes, 28 gold medals, and so many honors for accuracy in fields of precise timing. Now that's why throughout the world, no other name on a watch carries the prestige of Longine the world's most honored watch in sport. The watch of first choice with discriminating people the world over. And yet do you know that you may buy and own or buy and proudly give a Longines watch for as little as $71.50. Longines, the world's most honored watch. Premier product of the Longines Whitnor Watch Company since 1866 maker of watches of the highest character. We invite you to join us every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday evening at this same time for the Longines Chronoscope, a television journal of the important issues of the hour, broadcast on behalf of Longines, the world's most honored watch and Whitnor, distinguished companion to the world-honored Longines. This is Frank Knight, reminding you that Longines and Whitnor watches are sold and serviced from coast to coast by more than 4,000 leading jewelers who proudly display this emblem. Agency for Longines Whitnor Watches. It's timely pick the winner on the CBS Television Network. It's time for the Longine Chronoscope a television journal of the important issues of the hour. A presentation of the Longines Whitnor Watch Company, maker of Longines, the world's most honored watch, and Whitnor, distinguished companion to the world honored Longines. Good evening, this is Frank Knight. May I introduce our co-editors for this edition of the Longines Chronoscope? Mr. William Bradford Huey, editor of the American Mercury, and Mr. Elliot Haynes, 
Associate Editor of United Nations World. Our distinguished guest for this evening is the Honorable Fuller Warren, Governor of the State of Florida. Governor Warren, our viewers, of course, uh, know you as one of the more controversial political figures in the South. Uh, they remember uh, uh, a little uh, engagement that you had with uh, Senator Keefover during his investigation. And tonight, I'm sure that our viewers would like some of your uh, expressions as to the political situation in Florida. Now, first, sir, uh, we've had Governor Talmadge on this program uh, a few days ago, and he told us his position. We've had certain other southern governors. What's your position in the present national campaign, sir? Mr. Huey, I am 100% plus for Stevenson and Sparkman. Well, now, uh, are you one of the radical governors in the South, or are you conservative? Where do you fit in this political firmament? Uh, Mr. Huey, I think you might appropriately and aptly describe me as a liberal conservative. <laughs> Governor, does a, uh, a liberal, liberal conservative believe in the FEPC? Not a compulsory FEPC, uh, Mr. Haynes. We believe in the Constitution, as I believe all good Americans do, and as we read the Constitution, it doesn't give the federal government the power to pass an FEPC uh, that could be enforced with jail sentences. You're a but state's believe, writer then, are you? Well, I don't know so much about that. I'm an American first, but I believe in treating everybody fair and right and giving everybody an equal opportunity to a job. Well, now, uh, do Mr. Stevenson's positions on those issues uh, altogether suit you, sir? Well, uh, they come nearer suiting me than most positions on that subject do. Including uh, General Eisenhower's? Well, I can't tell just what his position is. He vacillates so and changes from day to day so that I can't keep up with it. Well, you know his latest position, Mr. Haynes? <laughs> <laughs> well, now, General Eisenhower <coughs> paid a widely publicized visit to your state recently. Uh, what was the effect of his trip there? Uh, well, it's hard to say, Mr. Huey. I've been in politics for 25 years, and about all that I've learned to do is to make a wild guess. So I don't pose as an expert or even a semi or quasi. I might be a pseudo expert, but he was well received there. A great many people turned out to see him and he was treated with that famous Florida hospitality and cordiality. The feeling is that he got more ho hospitality than he'll get votes down there. You think that also applies to uh, the effect that Jimmy Burns might have in his switch to Eisenhower? Well, Governor Burns is one of the most beloved and revered figures in the South. And uh, we have real affection for him in the South, but I doubt if any political leader's position in the South will greatly influence the votes of a great number of people in the South. Just about everybody in the South, as I suspect most of them are in the North and West, do their own voting, their independence when it comes to casting a vote. You yeah. have a lot of Republicans in Florida, don't you, Governor? Yes, sir. We've had a very large Republican infiltration into Florida in recent years, and I may say we've welcomed them because nearly all of them are solvent and well-heeled and uh, <laughs> capable of doing a whole lot to develop our state. They make fine citizens, but very, you might say, unsatisfactory voters. <clears throat> well, sir, now about Florida and uh, has the industrialization proceeded as fast in Florida as it has in other states? Very, very fast, Mr. Huey. For many years, we were long on tourism and agriculture, but short on industrialization. But under the beneficent policies of Roosevelt, uh, we have proceeded rapidly in the industrialization of Florida. Our industry is fast moving up alongside our agriculture and our tourism. Well, now, about tourism, uh, how important is tourism to the economy of Florida? Uh, Mr. Huey, it is n almost all important. The people of Florida have a total annual income of about three and a half billion dollars. About one billion of those three and a half billion dollars is derived from tourism. So you can see that about one out of every three and a half dollars we take in comes from these splendid fine, affluent people from other states who come to Florida for rest, relaxation, and reinvigoration and, and they, also, they also come for uh, divorces, don't they, Governor? 
Well, a few of them come down for marital liberation, but, uh, <laughs> uh, of course, well, that is one of the many, uh, you might say, facets of Florida's charm. Well, uh, is Florida able to compete with such states as Arkansas and Nevada in, in divorces? Uh, Mr. Huey, we are a little uh, bit handicapped. They have a, I believe, a six-day, a six day, I mean, six weeks residence requirement in those two states, and you have to live in Florida for the full period of 90 days before you can file a divorce suit. That means you make more money from each divorced uh, person, though. L yes, the uh, longer we keep them there, the more <laughs> they spend there, of course. But I believe it's money well spent because they get a new lease on life and recapture a whole lot of lost youth while they're down there. And, and just every way they're benefited and improved. It's the nearest thing to going to paradise that can be achieved without dying, Mr. Gambling, uh, is gambling included in, the, in that, Governor? No, sir. We have suppressed gambling in Florida almost completely for more than 50 years. It had operated just about as openly there as uh, filling stations. But in the last three or four years, we have just about suppressed illegal gambling. We have uh, gambling, a paramutual gambling at the horse tracks, the dog tracks, and at High Lie. But in Florida now, uh, you run a serious risk if you get in a dice game or a card game where there's any money on it. You wouldn't well, say that the Senator Kefover was responsible for that change, would you? Uh, he came down there and did a lot of shouting and hollering and screaming and bellering about it after we had uh, made a good start towards suppressing it. Uh, he is was using a special Senate committee for the purpose of promoting himself for president, and he just came down and got a lot of headlines and did a lot of tub thumping and uh, uh, noise making down there, Mr. Haynes. Well, I was it was Senator Kefauver, I believe, uh, charged that uh, some of those people around Miami were good friends of yours who were involved in that gambling. Uh, Mr. Huey, a man who runs for office is a good friend to everybody, and let him be a good friend to him. Uh, the fact is that under my administration, uh, illegal gambling in Florida has been suppressed for the first time in more than 50 years. It was introduced into Florida in the 80s, as I recall it, and it had run almost without molestation for all that time. But under my administration, we have practically suppressed illegal gambling. We have plenty of legal yeah. paramutual gambling. Governor, I wonder why that uh, side of the question didn't appear more plainly in the newspapers around the country. Well, uh, Senator Kefauver and his accomplices were seeing that it didn't. They were bringing out what evidence they wanted to bring out and suppressing what evidence they didn't want to come out. He was running for president. He was not uh, making a bona fide investigation, Mr. Haynes. Now, sir, since uh, tourism, to come back to that subject, since tourists uh, contribute about one-third of the total income of Florida, uh, is one of your uh, pleasures and uh, duties, perhaps, to uh, invite people there? Have you been on a tour, for instance? Uh, yes, sir. I have just covered 10 of the finest of the 48 states, uh, with the sole exception of Florida, which, of course, stands at the top of the list by any standard or measurement. But I have just come back from a tour of those 10 states, inviting everybody in those states who hasn't already been to Florida to come, and those who've already been there to come back. And I should at this time like to invite every person who is honoring us by listening in or looking in on this program, and I understand it's one of the most popular programs in the Western world, I should like <laughs> to invite every one of them to come to Florida. We have about five million annual visitors to Florida, but we've got room for plenty more uh, down there. Governor, <laughs> just uh, how many days in the year does the sun shine in Florida? Well, uh, its schedule is 365 days. It misses the schedule once in a while, Mr. Haynes, but in St. Petersburg, as you know, a publisher gave away his paper every day in the year that the sun didn't shine a little bit some of the day. Is he still in business? He's still in business and going strong, yes, sir. He's just about as in good a shape as uh, the Longines watches are. <laughs> well, 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 Governor, to come back to uh, the national political scene, uh, in which our viewers are particularly interested, uh, just uh, how do you believe that the election will go on November the 4th, 1952? Uh, Mr. Hewitt, you flatter me by asking me for what appears to be an opinion of mine, or you appear to be asking me for an opinion of mine. As I have said, I've been in the politics on the, mostly on the outer fringes of it for about 25 years. 
Uh, more than half of my lifetime, and all I can do is make a guess, and they're usually wild guesses. But I'll make a wild guess and say, in answer to your question, that the Republicans in 1952 A.D. will be defeated worse than they've been since 1936 A.D. You and remember they carried two states then. You think Florida will be in the Democratic column? Yes, sir, I do, and I'd like to give you, Mr. Haynes, a few of my reasons for believing that. In Florida, we have approximately 1,118,000 registered Democrats, with a big D, I mean. And we have about 88,000 Republicans and about 5,000 independents. I don't believe that the most credulous and naive man can believe that there'll be enough desertions among those 1,118,000 Democrats to give the Republicans a victory. We got a little taste of republicanism in 1928, and we never have recovered from it in Florida, Mr. Haynes. We got another little taste of it in 1950, when one of our counties, Pinellas County, went Republican, and the pe people are still weeping over it, almost. And uh, we just can't take the panics that seems to go with republicanism. We don't well, like hard times. We love prosperity down there, and we've got it under the Democrats. Well, Governor, I'm sure that our viewers have very much appreciated seeing you tonight, and thank you for being with us, sir. Thank you, Mr. Ewing. The opinions expressed are necessarily those of the speakers. The editorial board for this edition of the Longine Chronoscope was Mr. William Bradford Huey and Mr. Elliot Haynes. Our distinguished guest was the Honorable Fuller Warren, Governor of the State of Florida. It's World Series time again, the best days of the year for baseball fans. And this year again, the World Series is Longine time. Yes, all the umpires of both American and National Baseball Leagues use Longine watches exclusively for timing all the games, including the World Series. Truly, the most honored watch in the world of sport is Longine, the world's most honored watch. The only watch in history ever to win 10 World's Fair grand prizes, 28 gold medals, and so many honors for accuracy in fields of precise timing. That is why, throughout the world, no other name on a watch carries the prestige of Longines, the world's most honored watch in sport. The watch of first choice with discriminating people the world over. And yet do you know that you may buy and own or proudly give a Longines watch for as little as $71.50. Longines, the world's most honored watch. Premier product of the Longines Whitnor Watch Company since 1866 maker of watches of the highest character. We invite you to join us for the Longines Chronoscope, a television journal of the important issues of the hour, broadcast on behalf of Longines, the world's most honored watch, and Whitnor, distinguished companion to the world's honored Longines. This is Frank Knight, reminding you that Longines and Whitnor watches are sold and serviced from coast to coast by more than 4,000 leading jewelers who proudly display this emblem, Agency for Longines Whitnor Watches. Enjoy the Jackie Gleason Show on the CBS Television Network. Time for the Longine Chronoscope, a television journal of the important issues of the hour, brought to you every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. A presentation of the Longine Whitnor Watch Company, maker of Longine, the world's most honored watch, and Whitnor, distinguished companion to the world honored Longine. Good evening, this is Frank Knight. May I introduce our co-editors for this edition of the Longine Chronoscope? Mr. William Bradford Huey, editor of the American Mercury, and Mr. Henry Hazlitt, contributing editor of Newsweek magazine. Our distinguished guest for this evening is Mr. T. Lamar Cordell, former assistant United States Attorney General. 
Well, Mr. Cordell, now that you are back in private life and done with being a bureaucrat, perhaps you can tell us something about the pressures that were brought on you when you were Assistant Attorney General. What kind of pressures are they? Well, Mr. Hatchett, the pressures were, I would say, in the third dimension, if you can understand that. But they came largely from the senators and the congressmen, almost continuously from the prominent men in public life that were over on the hill. They come in the form of telephone calls or visits or what? Well, the, the greater number of communications, of course, were over the telephone, but, uh, but there were many, many conferences that were had with senators and congressmen in my office, and if the son they happened to be a little older and so busy, I would accommodate the gentleman go to his office. What would be a typical request? A typical request? Well... Would tax cases, for example, oh, be involved? Uh, oh, yes. When I was in the tax division, tax cases would be involved. I, I remember one uh, which troubled me a great deal, uh, most one of the very beloved, uh, one of the most beloved men in America. I surely do love him, and I have quoted him so many times. That was the vice president when they called me about an old friend of his down in Louisville. He wanted a favor from you, sir. Well, sir, he was he was uh, he was concerned about the the illness of this fellow, and I told him that everybody who came to see me about tax cases was sick or something. They were sick. Something something was wrong with them. And I told him that uh, the doctors and the government doctors felt that that the ordeal of a trial would not result in the gentleman's death and the, there was no other alternative but to go ahead with the unpleasant duty well, of... Well, now, Mr. Cordell, to identify you a little further for our viewers, of course, you're this man from... No you're from North Carolina, I believe. Yes, I'm from North Carolina. And then for about four years, you were uh, in the uh, tax division of the uh, Department of Justice. That's right. And you had the say, the authority to either prosecute a, a tax case or yes, else to sir. settle it. Yes, sir. It and was that, that's what brought you under all these pressures. That's right. Um, unfortunately, you can't delegate this power to another unless in your absence. And you really have to stand then up. Then all and these committees got after you, and then the president himself hauled off and fired you, didn't he? Yes, sir. He really broke loose on me. <laughs> <laughs> well, he I, had, did. <laughs> I thought that Truman had a, had a reputation of sticking by everybody. All his good friends, you were one of his good friends. I you? sure thought so. <laughs> I tell you, he broke the legend though when he, when he, uh, when he, when he knocked me out. What, what makes what's your theory as to why the president uh, singled you out and gave you the boot in such a fashion? Well, I. It would take too long to go into my theory. Well, that, that, <laughs> you're, you're, our, our viewers, of course, know you yeah. as one of these mink men. Uh, your your wife uh, at least got a, got out of Washington with a mink coat, didn't well, she? Well, she got out of one that was paid for. That was one thing, and she paid for it. I have to the last part, though. I see. And, and uh, it was, uh, well, did that mink coat have anything to do with it? I don't much believe it. I don't believe it did. Uh, Mrs. Truman has a mink coat. And, and uh, I reckon a mother who has... Uh, Long one for so uh, one and one for so long, and and she argued that it would last for ten years, just renovate uh, to be renovated just uh, once a year. That it was all right. I told her it would certainly get me into trouble if she bought it. What specifically were were you charged with whenever you were fired? Well, outside activities. I've been trying to find out, Mister Who, what the outside activities were. Does that just mean doing favors for your friends? I, I don't know. It's one of those things that uh, the president did not tell the attorney general, Mr. McGrath. I tried to find out. I've been trying to find out what these outside activities were. Well, um, Mr. Cordell, you yes, were... Sir, I, I, I really don't know. Uh, at the uh, end of one of the committee hearings, the chairman of a subcommittee, uh, Congressman King, a year ago, asserted that you had been recreant to your trust and had done irreparable damage to the government. Now. What is your comment on that statement? Yeah, he said he said I had I had done a disservice to my government, and I say to you, Mr. Hazard, when when uh, Chairman Cecil King made that remark, he he did a disservice to his government, and he did a disservice to the honorable people in that tax division. How many? Yeah, I didn't like that statement either. How many tax no, cases do about it in more. the four years you were you were in this tax position, sir? How many cases would you estimate that you handled? Approximately sixteen thousand civil cases. Probably 45% were compromised and settled, and approximately 2,500 income tax fraud cases. 
I see. Now, these cases, you, you uh, I'd like you to tell our viewers, uh, you, you get calls from members of Congress uh, during this period very often, didn't you? Oh, yes, sir. And those members of Congress, uh, they wanted you to, to uh, favorably consider uh, their constituents, I assume. Yes, sir. They had. That's part of the system, isn't oh, it? Oh yes, they were. They were. They were. A strong representation had been made to these gentlemen. They were honorable in all of their relations with me. Uh, they were. Some were very much convinced that uh, I was about to do an injustice by indicting someone, and of course I would try to convince the congressman that I had no other alternative because the facts were so strong that, that it just had to be done. Well, I'd like to take up one specific case. Let's take the case of the Kansas City vote frauds. Right. Now, you were in on that for a while. That's were right. you called in by anybody, or did you step in by yourself? No, sir, the Kansas City in, uh, uh, investigation uh, stemmed from a good many calls that we received in the way of complaints from individuals out in the congressional district that uh, Congressman Axtell and uh, Congressman Slaughter... Now, this, this was in 1946. Yes, so that was when and I was in charge Axtell of... Congressman Axtell was the uh, congressman that uh, the Democratic candidate that President Truman favored. Yes. Sir. And it was, it was argued that fraud was used to elect him over his Democratic opponent. Oh, that was the case. It, yes, so that, sir, that yes. was the case. The president and a lot of... Uh, uh, to do was done about it in Kansas City, oh, yeah. and then it came to your attention. Is that what that's happened? That's right, yes. that's right. Now, sir, uh, just by way of information, uh, how does a man who's been district attorney down in North Carolina, how does he get a position such as you occupied in Washington? Some senator bring you there? No, sir. No senator had anything to do with my going to Washington. Um, Mr. Clark told me that when I took over the office as United States Attorney, it had the lowest rating in the United States, and when, and when um, he wanted one to fill the vacancy that he had created by accepting the, the Attorney Generalship of the country, uh, he said that because of the splendid record which I had made, uh, he had talked with the President, and they had decided to extend the invitation to me. And that was why I came to Washington. Uh, neither Senator Huey, who was Senator then, or Senator Bailey, I believe, Senator so Bailey, uh, neither one of the gentlemen uh, knew uh, about the invitation to come, and of course Mr. Then, Clark told me he went to see them personally. Then after you get uh, such a position uh, where you have the decision over many dollars, millions of dollars in tax cases, all of these calls that you get from the White House, from members of Congress, uh, that's inherent in our system, isn't it? Yes, sir. It's, uh, it is a very, very normal thing that one who has, who has to make the decision, he has to face it. That's just all it is. Well, Mr. Cordell, I'd like to get back uh, to this specific case that we took up because I think <coughs> it would uh, clarify the whole situation mm -hmm. if we went into something like, let's say, the Kansas City vote case. Now, you were called in on that, and you stayed in for a while, and then you were taken off it? Well, Is that right? No, what, what happened, Mr. Hazard, was that um, the preliminary investigation, this preliminary investigation had become quite a famous memoranda, memorandum. Uh, the FBI had uh, completed its uh, preliminary investigation in embracing all oh, the, the Kansas City all, case. Yes, yes. Oh, the Kansas City case, embracing the investigation of the Kansas City Star. Yes. They had... Uh, of 50 investigators, and there were 8,000 people interviewed, and out of that number, 1,354 affidavits were taken, and that was a part of the preliminary investigation that were reported to me by the FBI. Now, of course, we analyzed these things. You turned it over to the FBI. Well, we... We asked them to investigate. We asked them to, to, um, to make a preliminary investigation so uh, uh, to determine, because we knew if we had a full investigation, it would cost a staggering sum of money because it made it cost almost $300,000. Well, did the dollars. president call you off that investigation or no, was it no, through his no, orders sir. that you were called off? Oh, no, no, no. And I, no, sir. Uh, I was, um, I, I, rece I never received any communication from the White House from any source and we all really believed that the facts were not sufficient to warrant a further investigation because we could not find where there was any evidence that two or more people conspired together to deprive someone of a right well, to vote. Mr. Cardell, uh, one of the important things to you, <coughs> I believe, is that within the last two or three weeks, you've un undergone extensive investigation in Washington by the Chelf Committee. That's right. Uh, after which, uh, Mr. Chelf uh, uh, more or less rendered this judgment in which he said that you were, quote, an honest man who was indiscreet in his associations 
and a pliant conformer to the peculiar moral climate of Washington. Climate. Now, uh, is that a fair uh, uh, description of, of your experience there, sir? Well, I know that the chairman and Mr. Keating was right when they said to the American people that I was an honest man. I have no disagreement there at all, and I know they're right. Now they and spoke of the peculiar moral climate of Washington. Is well, it peculiar? It, it is the most peculiar. I think they were right there. It was the most it's the most peculiar moral climate you'll find any city in the world. Everybody who gets off at Union Station, off a bus, or when he parks his car, or comes in from the National Airport, he goes to Washington for something. And he's disappointed if he does not take it home with him. I see. Well, I'm sure that uh, our viewers have very much appreciated these frank statements from you tonight, sir, and thank you for being with us. The opinions that you've heard our speakers express tonight are entirely their own. The editorial board for this edition of the Longines Chronoscope was Mr. William Bradford Huey and Mr. Henry Hazlitt. Our distinguished guest was Mr. T. Lamar Cordell, former assistant United States Attorney General. A watchmaker such as Longines recalls that Christopher Columbus made his great voyages before the watch was invented. His only timepiece, an hourglass, like this 15th century one, which happens to be the property of the Hayden Planetarium. This, of course, had to be reversed every half hour. Now, Columbus Day marks a milestone for Longines watches, too, because this gold medal was presented to Longines at the St. Louis Columbian Exhibition, which honored the 400th anniversary of Columbus's discovery of America. Now, consider how consistently Longines watches have maintained their leadership over the years. Longines is the only watch in history to win 10 World's Fair grand prizes, 28 gold medals, and literally thousands of awards for accuracy from great government observatories. Today's Longines watches are our finest, distinguished for exclusive styling, endowed with those traditional qualities of accuracy and long life for which Longines watches are world honored. Truly, throughout the world, no other name on a watch means so much as Longines, the world's most honored watch. Premier product of the Longines Whitnor Watch Company. Since 1866, maker of watches of the highest character. We invite you to join us every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday evening at this same time for the Longines Chronoscope, a television journal of the important issues of the hour. Broadcast on behalf of Longines, the world's most honored watch, and Whitnor, distinguished companion to the world honored Longines. This is Frank Knight, reminding you that on election day, you're the most important person in the country. So exercise your privilege as an American citizen and vote for the candidate of your choice. Now Tuesday nights, leave it to Larry on the CBS television network.